Welcome folks to another video. Instead of a furniture flip, this one is all about the business of flipping and refinishing furniture, some tips and tricks, and maybe some things that you were questioning and weren't sure about. This isn't about the act of refinishing or products. This is about the business side of it. I'm doing this ABC style, but please note this list is not complete or exhaustive by any means. There is so much more to this business than I could ever put in 26 bullet points. For each letter, I could have come up with several options, but I tried to pick the most important ones. As such, I am breaking this up into two videos. This one will be the first 13 letters, and in two days, I'll be posting the second part, so watch for that. There is so much I've learned over the past approximately five years or so of doing this, much of it the hard way. My hopes in creating this list that it might save you guys some time and effort if you're just starting out. So go grab a drink or a snack, snack. and maybe a pen and paper, and let's get into the ABCs of flipping furniture as a business. My name is Angie and I'm the one behind Transcend Furniture Gallery, a business created from the love of vintage furniture and the desire to take broken, dated and unloved things and turn them into modern treasures. Sometimes I paint and sometimes I don't, but I always do what I can to save old pieces from the trash. Welcome to my workroom. So A, I chose accessibility, where you live, where you can find projects to work on and how you can sell your pieces. In terms of finding pieces to work on, for more rural areas, you may come across better prices for your pieces, but it may mean driving farther. So you need to factor that gas cost into your total price that you paid for the piece. In terms of selling, you'll have more access to potential buyers in You'll have access to more potential buyers in a city and could likely get more for your piece than if you're rural like I am. But one thing to consider is that many people in cities don't have a car or they drive small commuter cars. So offering delivery might be something you should consider if you have the vehicle for it. Or as is the case where I am, 90% of my buyers are outside of my semi-rural area. So most of my buyers request delivery, partially due to them maybe not having a vehicle big enough to transport the piece but I think more so because they don't want to drive an hour or more each way to come and get it. People are busy. They have families and online shopping with shipping or delivery is just the way of the world right now. I actually love delivering pieces, but one mistake I made starting out was offering free delivery. That adds up over time, believe me. <laughs> I started that way because I wasn't confident in my work and abilities and didn't really have a good grasp on return on investment. I also wanted to stand out for my competition by offering free delivery, which I did, but at a significant cost, both to my profit margin as well as wear and tear on my vehicle, which I wasn't accounting for. Maybe you could offer free delivery within 10 or 15 minutes of your home, but beyond that, you should really be covering your gas expenses at a minimum. There's wear and tear on your car, and aside from fuel costs, for longer drives, you may need to stop for a drink or snacks. <laughs> These are business expenses that should absolutely be worked into the cost of the delivery. There's also the question of where and how you will sell your items. Do you have a retail location? Do you rent space in a booth? Do you work out of your home? If you don't have a steady flow of foot traffic where you are, you're going to need to be online. I had a storefront for about three years and still 90% of my business came from my Instagram or Facebook page. Maybe another 5% from Marketplace or Kijiji. I was the only one supplying my storefront and I was really struggling to keep furniture in store long enough for people to get kind of the full experience I was going for. Were I to do it again, I would absolutely try to have other furniture artists and vintage sellers selling in my space to help take that pressure off me. My storefront was ideal for selling smalls like vintage books and little decor pieces, but most of the furniture sold online. That was the main reason why during the lockdown last year, I decided to close my retail space. It just wasn't worth the high overhead in my town. It may be different where you're located or if it's a larger business with multiple sellers. But for me, as I mentioned, most of my business came from outside of my town. B is working with buyers. Can't do it without the buyers. <laughs> Many people approach this business as a casual sales environment, but if you're looking to do this full time, you need to treat it like a legitimate business with professionalism and boundaries. So many people are accustomed to the yard sale mentality, especially with online buy and sell sites. 
you take $200. For a $500 item, <laughs> it's pretty common. I can't stress this enough. If you want to succeed, you need to stay firm on your pricing. My Facebook Marketplace ads literally state that the price is firm in the top opening paragraph, along with my location and ways to collect the piece. This will turn some buyers off just will. But trust me, these aren't the buyers you want anyway. You want people that value what you do, value the pieces that you're selling, and value your time. If you like the idea of haggling, and some people do, and letting the buyer feel like they're getting a better deal, and happy buyers often become repeat buyers, you can compromise by adding a small margin to your asking price, and then countering their offer with something in the middle. It's a win-win, you get what you feel your effort is worth, and the buyers get a little bit of a price cut. If you get in the habit of lowering your prices, people will catch on to this quickly. And instead of offering to buy that newly listed dresser immediately, they're gonna wait until you lower the price. This is the difference between people who do this as a hobby and the people trying to make a career out of it. Even though I struggle with this at times, until my YouTube journey began, this furniture flipping has been my only source of income for this last year entirely. I priced my work fairly, considering the construction and design of the piece, what was done to the piece, and what it would cost to go buy something similar in quality brand new. Most of my pieces sell almost immediately, but there are lulls occasionally, I'm in one now, and I'll have three or four pieces sitting unsold. This doesn't buy groceries <laughs> or cover my car payment. So sometimes I just have to grit my teeth and lower the price to get some cash flow. I really hate doing that because I don't want people to think that if they just hold out for long enough, eventually the price will come down. Does that make sense? For example, right now, I have two really high quality pieces for sale and I absolutely will not lower the price. They are already insanely cheap when you consider purchasing something of equal quality brand new. And no matter what happens, even if they sit for a month, the price is the price on these pieces. On items that maybe aren't as high quality, those ones I feel I can play with a little bit more in terms of pricing if things get financially tight for a little while. But even still, I really don't like doing that. The right buyer will eventually come along for that higher price piece as long as it's a fair price for the work and quality. Anyone will take a cheap piece, but you need to value your own time and work if you want this to be a successful and sustainable business. Another aspect of working with buyers and sellers, to be honest, is safety. It's always best if you can have a helper come with you on deliveries and pickups, especially if you're a woman. It pains me to say this, but it is an unfortunate reality. Wherever possible, try to meet people in public places. And if you can't, make sure you give the address of where you're going to your spouse or family member or friend. No one wants to think about this sort of thing, but it is important. It's better to be overly careful than not careful enough, of course. <laughs> C is custom work. You are going to get asked if you take custom orders. It's a given, especially if you're good at what you do. I personally do not. There are several reasons I don't want to. Firstly, I don't want the pressure. It's one thing to pick up a piece at a yard sale, to work on and have things not go right, and another thing for that to happen on someone's grandmother's family heirloom. <laughs> Things do sometimes go wrong when you're working on old pieces. Sometimes you can work through the problem and remedy it, and sometimes you just have to pull the plug. So that's a stress I don't want for myself. Not everyone feels this way though, and there is money to be made in custom work if you structure it properly. Another reason I don't is that some people, at least around here, don't understand how much work goes into refinishing a piece and thus don't expect to pay what your time is worth. I've had people expect that a piece be 50 to $100 to refinish, when in reality, that's probably just what the materials alone cost, especially with new hardware or legs. And that doesn't even account for your time. So how do you price custom work? That's different for everyone. There's no one magic formula, but a basic rule of thumb that I learned years ago is to take a good look at the piece in question. Determine the most you would pay for this piece if you were purchasing it for yourself for a project. Then determine the minimum you would sell that piece for if you refinished it the same way the client is requesting. Determine the cost of your materials. Take the hypothetical selling price, subtract the hypothetical purchase price, and that new number is the base cost of your custom fee 
plus your materials. In most cases, this is at least a few hundred dollars. That's just one way to do it. That's not gonna work for every situation. Other people charge for the materials and then an hourly rate, as some techniques and finishes are more time consuming than others. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Figure out what works best for you and your client, but make sure you're not selling yourself short. And for goodness sake, <laughs> write up a contract and take a deposit. I'm a member of many furniture flipping and painting groups on Facebook. And almost daily, I read posts from people who entered into an agreement without a contract, without a deposit, do the work. And the person buying either changed their minds on color or bailed completely. And the people who did this, they're often friends of the furniture person <laughs> doing the work. Family and friends are still clients and you should still set up a contract when doing work for them. They can be brutal, it's true. Your contract should state things like a full description of the piece in question, as well as photographs of it in its before condition, noting areas of current damage, etc. It should state what the intended colors, products used, and specialty finishes, like wax or glaze, distressing, etc. Uh, will be. It should state the proposed price, date of completion, or at least a price, or at least a date range, as well as making note that if the buyer changes their minds on colors or treatments at any point during the process, that these changes will impact the purchase price. You should also take a non-refundable deposit that covers the cost of any materials you need to purchase so that if the buyer backs out before any work begins, you aren't stuck with the bill for those items. If you plan to do mainly custom work, it wouldn't hurt to contact a lawyer to help you set up a contract template that you can use over and over, just changing the details on it where necessary. This might all seem like overkill until you get blindsided and screwed on a deal. <laughs> Trust me, do the work now and you'll set yourself up for success. The damaged pieces. Once you become known in your area, you'll often have people messaging you, offering you pieces for free or sending you links to roadside finds. Sometimes these are hidden gems in need of a good polishing and most free pieces need at least some repair work. Be wary though of pieces with too much damage. If you're just doing this for fun or to make a few bucks on the side, have at her. But if this is your business now, or at least you want it to be, you really need to consider how long some of these repairs are gonna take. Some pieces are not worth the time it takes to fix them. Unless profit's not your main motivation. And this pains me to say because you know me, I love taking on the profit projects no one else will touch. It's a bit different for me now that I have a YouTube channel. As you know, channels can be monetized once you hit certain thresholds. So this allows me to make a bit of money on the videos of the worst, most time consuming refinishing jobs on top of what I get for selling the pieces. For example, I did a video recently of a small, tall mid-century dresser covered in many layers of paint. It reeked of cigarette smoke and needed some special attention. This piece, because it's small, only sold for about $300. It took nearly two full days of work to redo it. So that's approximately 10 to 12 hours of work time. The piece itself was free, but I drove two and a half hours each way to pick it up along with another dresser that I also refinished. So that's a full tank of gas, which is about 60 to 65 bucks right now. I used about $40 in materials on this one dresser, uh, strippers, odor blocking, primers, paint, stain, top coat, and a set of used legs, which I purchased somewhere for about 10 bucks. So that's $110 in, leaving $190 profit. If you divide that $190 by 12, hours, that's a whopping $15 and change per hour for my time. So that's barely above minimum wage here. So you can see in this perfect example that the free, highly damaged or difficult pieces aren't always going to be the best investments for potential projects because there are hidden costs. Sure, they're so satisfying to save. And for me, I can make a bit more money from my YouTube revenue. But even with that, I have to factor in the time to film it all, edit it, do the voiceovers and uploading is usually several hours per video. You see what I'm saying? I'm not suggesting that you only purchase pristine or near pristine pieces to work on. I'm simply saying that you really need to consider your profit margins if you want to do this successfully as a business. E, it's a doozy. Everyone has an opinion. Isn't that the truth? One thing I can tell you for sure, no matter what style you do, 
or how nice your pieces are, is that there will be people who hate it. <laughs> Sad fact. But it's true. There are always people who die a little inside every time they see a piece of wood painted. And they don't care that it was broken on the side of the road with half the finish gone and deep gouges all over it and missing drawers. They only see the finished product and assume you just painted over a priceless antique in mint museum quality condition and you just ruined any and all value for the piece. This is just something that you're gonna have to get used to dealing with. And you can't really win because even if you only restore wood grain and don't paint it, there will then be people that say, Oh my God, that so dated. Or, Why didn't you change those ugly handles? You will, however, have a great group of loyal followers who love and respect what you do, cherish those people, pour your time and energy into those people, interact with them, and let them know how much you appreciate their kindness. You have two choices with the haters. Simply ignore them or educate them. And by educate, I don't mean be condescending or sarcastic. It's hard for me because I'm always sarcastic, but anyway. But perhaps message them privately and tell them that while you respect their opinion, <laughs> Remind them that these things, like art, are subjective and maybe even send them a before photo of the piece. Sometimes they don't realize what you started with and can have a change of heart. My best advice though is honestly don't waste your time and energy on them. Don't give them any of your joy. <laughs> I was horribly bullied as a child. I was quiet and smart and not wealthy, which is a bad combination for being popular, apparently. Much like schoolyard bullies though, you can't let them know they got to you, even if they did. If it's a nasty comment on your Facebook page or your listing, just block them and move on with your day. Now, all that said, there's a difference between someone being purposefully rude and obnoxious and someone offering constructive criticism. But even that's a fine line, really. Someone might think they're just offering constructive criticism, but if you didn't ask for opinions, it can be inappropriate and it can still really hurt. You'd be surprised how many people on my YouTube videos have commented about how horrible my tattoos are. And I had one person recently say something along the lines of, I came here for work, not tattoos. I can't cut my arms off, so what do you want me to do? It just goes with the territory. You have to develop a thicker skin or just figure out a way to deal. Another thing, as I've said in a video before, is that value is not a static thing. The value of a piece is what someone is willing to pay for it. You can say an antique dresser is worth $5,000 because it's an antique made by so-and-so from wherever during whatever time frame. But if no one is willing to pay five grand for that piece, it's not really worth it, is it? It's complicated and there's always two sides to this. F is finding pieces to work on. Some of the best places to score project pieces are buy and sell groups online, Facebook Marketplace, Kijiji or Craigslist uh, yard sales, online and in-person auctions, thrift stores, estate sales, and even roadside giveaways. Things are getting pretty competitive in the online groups now and marketplace as well, as more and more people are trying this out. But not everyone is gonna make it in this business. It's not for everyone. Some will discover it's way more work than they expected, that it can be frustrating to deal with complete strangers over the internet, offering you half of your asking price. Some will find it just takes up too much space in their home or it's too messy or too much time in general. People will often contact me with pieces they have for sale. And while I would love to take them all, I have to make sure that they realize that as a reseller, I can't pay what someone buying for themselves can pay. I have to make sure I can make a profit to make it worth my time. And I'm honest with them right, right up front. If the piece is mint, I will politely decline and tell them they would definitely get more for it in a private sale. If the piece is horribly damaged, I politely decline and tell them I'm not sure I'd be able to recoup the cost of bringing it back. But if it's right in the middle, a sweet spot, good bones with a few issues, some cosmetic stuff, maybe a few minor repairs. I tell them roughly what I tend to pay for pieces in similar conditions and they can either say yay or nay. Thrift stores like Salvation Army, Habitat for Humanity, Value Village, these places used to have great prices on furniture, but even in the last two years, their prices have at least tripled as the vintage craze grows and more and more people are looking to score a great project piece. People selling on Marketplace are also seeing refinishers and resellers selling the restored MCM and antique pieces for good money 
and then incorrectly <laughs> assume that their wobbly dresser with half the finish gone must be worth at least half that, right? I mean, it has skinny legs. <laughs> the prices have at least doubled in the last few years on places like Marketplace and Kijiji. And a piece that I might have gotten for 50 or $60 back then, people are now asking two or $300 for in horrible condition. <laughs> And because the market is flooded with fellow flippers and resellers, we're having to pay those prices now. So that's just something to consider if you're thinking about getting into this. Another issue with the competitiveness online is that more and more often, people trying to purchase don't get to see the items ahead of time before purchasing, which is always desirable. Most of the time I pay with e-transfer based on the description and photos and any questions I ask in order to secure the sale and make sure I get the piece. There are risks with paying ahead of time. There's the risk of being ripped off, of course, number one. <laughs> Number two, the risk that there's hidden damage or orders that fail to disclose. A few good questions to ask are, is there any smoke or cigarette or pet orders, musty odors? Keeping in mind that people aren't always going to be honest. Do the drawers all work properly? Is there any significant damage? Cosmetic stuff aside. And also everyone's worst nightmare, because is it possible that there could be bed bugs or cockroaches? in the furniture. I've never personally run into this, but I know it's a statistical <laughs> certainty that at some point someone will try to pull the wool over my eyes. So just keep that in mind too. <laughs> Always ask if they're willing to hold the piece for you to look it over first. They won't hold without payment. You have to make a choice whether you're comfortable sending money to a complete stranger that you might never get back. If you're not comfortable sending the full amount, maybe ask if they would consider a deposit just to confirm your interest with the rest paid upon pickup. Note that even if they do say, I'll hold it without payment, they could still sell it to someone else before you get there. It happens all the time. It's just something you need to realize if you decide you don't want to send money ahead of time and you want to see the piece beforehand. They could sell it out from under you, but you just have to sort of weigh the risks and figure out what works best for you. G was a hard one, <laughs> but get by or get new. So one thing you can really get caught up in just starting out is the huge array of products and tools available to make your job easier. It's so tempting to go buy that fancy surf prep sander before you even sell your third piece or go and buy all the fusion mineral paint colors in one go. Hey, if your budget allows for that, have fun. For most of us though, we need to sort of pick and choose what we start off with and then add to our stash as time and money allow. I have a video I did a bit ago, my workroom tour. I'll pop a link down below if you wanna check it out. My garage is now almost a Home Depot, <laughs> but it took me years to amass that much. And I still only have about a quarter of what I think I need and would like to try out. There's a few things to not skimp out on though, even if you're just starting out. Good quality brushes and good top coats are a couple of those things, but the other things you can buy is you can afford to. If you don't have a power sander and don't have the money for one, you can get away with just hand sanding and scraping finishes until you're able to get one. It's a heck of a lot more work, but they've been doing furniture that way for centuries. And if you're only painting anyway, you don't really need to sand down to the bare wood. Plus, I think it's important for us to know the basics, even if we don't use them every day. And even if we use fancy tools most of the time, at least knowing how something should be or could be or used to be refinished, it's a handy thing to know. Buying used on Marketplace is also a good option just to get you started and then you can upgrade when you can. I have a $100 orbital sander. I've seen the surf prep and fancy Festool products and definitely drool over them. But until I can comfortably do it, me and Mr. DeWalt will be just fine. Before I got the DeWalt, I had a $40 Black & Decker mouse sander, you know, the little triangular ones. So I'm just working my way up as I can. A table saw can make repairs so much faster and easier, but even I don't have one yet. Once the budget allows for it, I'll definitely be grabbing one. I guess what I'm trying to say is that make sure this is really for you before you spend the money on the fancy stuff, both in terms of your enjoyment and making sure you can sustain yourself on the income you're getting in your area. You might flip five or 10 pieces and decide that it's just too much time, that it's too messy or it's too much work or maybe there just isn't the market for it that you thought there would be in your area. Always get by with what you have until not having that one thing becomes detrimental to your business. Again, this is more for folks on a budget like me. <laughs> H, heavy, heavy. <laughs> 
I know this one seems obvious because we're talking about furniture here. But you'd be surprised how many people say they want to start doing this without considering the logistics of both physically lifting the pieces and then transporting them. Clearly, if you're only working on nightstands and small end tables or chairs, you might be just fine with a regular sized car or hatchback. An SUV gives you more options. I currently drive a Jeep Cherokee with roof racks. I can easily fit a six foot dresser with the legs off, the back seats folded down and the front seat folded. I'm lucky that my front seat folds down, most just sort of tip forward. I purchased this vehicle specifically with furniture in mind and I love that for the most part, I can pick up and deliver rain or shine. The roof racks come in handy if I have hutch tops or additional pieces that don't fit inside. Trucks are handy if they have a longer box. The shorter boxes I find less useful in an SUV because the bigger pieces have to be strapped in and then they hang out the back a little bit and you're also limited to working when it's sunny out. As far as moving pieces in hand, you have to have a fairly significant strength and a good pack if you're on your own. I do have a helper to help me load and unload pieces from home. When I'm picking up, delivering, or going to and from my storage room, which is outside of the house, I'm often by myself. I'm five foot nine and stronger than a lot of men. <laughs> so it's not uncommon for me to load and unload huge pieces on my own. I do have a dolly with inflated rubber tires that help tremendously with the heaviest pieces, but you still need to be strong enough to maneuver them on and off the dolly and in and out of the car. If you have a friend or partner to help you, that's amazing. If you don't, always ask before you commit to buying a piece online if someone is gonna be there that's available to help you load it up. There's nothing worse, and I've done it before, than being super excited about a piece you just committed to online and getting there to find out it's in the basement with narrow stairs and tight corners and there's no one to help you. Also, you need to be careful. You get one body, so be careful with it. Accept help where it's available and lift smart, use your legs as much as possible and invest in an upright dolly or hand truck to help take some of that load. I is identify responsibly. Anyone who does this job knows exactly what I mean when I say everyone has an opinion and I covered it earlier. Some people despise anything with paint. Some have preferences for how that paint is applied. For example, farmhouse chippy versus modern smooth sleek. Some only like paint and others only want to see refreshed, refinished wood. And then there are others that think that any refinishing destroys the patina of an old piece. Long story short, we'll always have fans and haters no matter which route you decide to go. We as furniture flippers, furniture artists, restorers, refinishers, whatever you want to, whatever the label, we have an inherent responsibility to learn about and know what we're working on. There are of course people who just slap paint on pieces that don't really need it just to turn a quick profit. And while that's totally their prerogative, after all, it's their furniture, I'm specifically talking about people who wanna turn this into a legitimate and respectable business. We can technically do whatever the heck we wanna do with pieces that we own, regardless of its history or style. But while we shouldn't necessarily censor what we wanna do with a piece based on other people's style preferences, I do feel that we owe it to the piece we're working on to at least try to learn about what it is and where it comes from. I get flack on occasion for painting or partially painting uh, vintage or antique pieces. Here's the thing. Not every piece from the 50s and 60s with tapered legs is a priceless gem. Many were mass produced in factory settings and are a dime a dozen. And not every antique dresser or hutch is a work of art just because it's old. I can't speak for everyone here, but for me personally, I don't like to work on pieces that are mint or near mint condition. A little chip or a spot here and there, to me, doesn't always mean I need to fully refinish that piece. For me, the seemingly hopeless cases are my favorite to work on because everybody else is going to pass them by and most would end up in a landfill otherwise. Let me say something here. Damage, actual finished damage is not patina. It drives me crazy when people say, oh, that probably had a lovely patina. Why did you refinish it? Well, I refinished it because the finish was no longer protecting the wood as it's supposed to do and the wood was suffering and deteriorating because of that damage. Refinishing in this situation will prolong the life of the piece even if the character or patina is lost. Patina is a term used to describe the appearance of something that has grown more beautiful with aging, such as myself. 
such as the warm, deep glow of an old pine dresser or the green film that often appears on old copper and bronze. An art deco or even mid-century piece with scratches, flaking shellac and lacquer, water stains, etc. That's damage. <laughs> That is not character, that is not patina, that's damage. I usually tend to leave some of the character marks on older pieces where I can like not standing out every little mark or ding. I believe it's possible to update a piece without making it look like it just came out of a factory showroom. If you want that finished, go buy a brand new piece. <laughs> that's what I tell people sometimes. To me, this is just a nod of respect to the piece. Maybe I'm weird. I am weird, but anyway. That's just my two cents. I don't paint priceless works of Scandinavian art by famous mid-century designers, and I'm not painting anything rare, like rare. My goal is to leave a piece in better condition than I found it. And by condition, I don't mean the subjective style of it. I mean that the actual construction materials are restored and protected in one way or another, which will prolong the life of the piece. Always look a piece over for stamps, uh, maker's marks, and stickers. Often the maker's mark is on an interior drawer or the back of the piece. Sometimes there are dates stamped into the wood, sometimes printed on the back panel. Old vanity and dresser mirrors sometimes are date stamped on the back of the actual mirror itself. So if the back panel of the mirror it looks like it's easy to remove, have a peek and often you'll see a date there. Also check the underside of drawers. There's a website I use called WorthPoint. It's a service that provides you with the actual sold prices of almost anything you can think of, really. Pulling data from eBay and auction sites. I've typed in things like vintage mahogany console table with carved legs and found similar items what I was looking for and sometimes even the exact thing. It's helped me determine the makers of pieces where there were no mark makers mark available on the piece. It's also a much more accurate estimation of selling prices than looking things up on eBay, for example, where you can only see the list prices, which are usually really inflated. This was of a huge help when I had my storefront and also sold non-furniture, vintage and antique items. I'll drop a link below if you wanna have a look. The monthly subscription, but if you do a lot of wheeling and dealing and vintage and antique stuff, it might be useful to you. J was also difficult, <laughs> but I picked just practice first. <laughs> if you're completely new to this, I can understand how it would be so intimidating to just jump right in with both feet. I would never recommend that anyway. I get a lot of messages similar to, I love your videos and you've inspired me. My grandmother's table has been sitting unused and I wanna give it a refresh. As an example. And while that's fantastic, it's also a little scary for me because it takes a lot of time and practice to get good at doing this. YouTube videos can be somewhat of an illusion. It all looks so quick and easy when in reality it's messy, it's frustrating at times, challenging, it's time consuming. Things do go wrong sometimes. I would never recommend starting out on anything that means something to you or your family. Go grab some cheap side tables or a lower end dresser. Explore the learning curve on those pieces. For example, once you sand through veneer, that's it. There's no going back. <laughs> There's no fixing it. You can disguise it, but not always successfully, or you can paint it or patch it, but that's definitely not for beginners. There's no quick fix. The veneer is ruined and it's really easy to sand through veneer. Learn to strip and sand on small pieces first before you tackle anything large or valuable, particularly sentimentally valuable. And as far as paint goes or colored waxes and glazes, get a few cheap, scrap pieces of wood to practice your techniques on first before doing an entire dresser. Make sure the colors that are in your head will look right in real life before they go on a piece of furniture. Don't start out big and definitely don't start out on pieces of value. Okay, keep learning. I get on average between Instagram and Facebook and most recently YouTube at least 15 to 20 messages daily with questions from people looking for advice. Sometimes it's, I have this piece, what would you do with it? Sometimes it's more like, I started this piece and things aren't going as planned, help. <laughs> and sometimes it's, I just bought this, how do I refinish it step by step? I really wish I had the time to answer each and every question. I try to answer simple ones when I'm able to, but it's literally impossible to teach someone everything they could possibly run into or need to know about how to redo a piece start to finish in one email. <laughs>
Not only would that email take hours and hours to compose, it would undoubtedly be some back and forth. And multiply that one interaction by 15 to 20 per day, it's not possible. <laughs> Believe me, it's not that I don't want the help. I mean, that's why I started this channel in the first place. Speaking of which, if you're enjoying this video and my channel and want to see more like it, please give me a thumbs up and comment telling me which letter in this video has helped you the most. There's Willow. <laughs> You've seen her in a couple other videos. Also, consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell so you don't miss out on any other videos. I've watched in the last several years thousands of hours of YouTube videos. I purchased dozens of ebooks and online courses, some costing upwards of a couple hundred dollars and I'm not exaggerating. And I still don't know it all, not even close. People often watch my videos and comment, oh, you should try this in a different way or check out this other way of doing the same thing. And while I appreciate that, totally, as occasionally it is a new thing that I haven't heard of and can be helpful for other viewers reading the comments who might not know, just because I use a certain technique or product in a video doesn't mean it's the only way I know how to do that thing. <laughs> it's just the technique or product I chose for that situation. My point in saying this is that the knowledge and internal database that I have, I collected over time by constantly learning. I didn't watch one video on how to paint and call it a day. No, I tried that method. I kept watching other videos and reading blog posts and eventually collected several ways of doing it, not to mention my own trial and error. This crazy amount of information takes years to build, so I can't just send someone a few paragraphs, condensing all that down into a short how-to. There are a hundred things that could go wrong with stripping, sanding, staining, painting, repairing, sealing, listing, and selling. The best I can do is try to keep putting out videos with little tidbits and tricks I've learned over the years. I don't consider this an outright tutorial channel. It's more, this is what I did to make this piece better. Here are a few things I used and did if you want to try for yourself, rather than step one, step two. When I first started doing furniture, the whole time I was working on a piece, I had my laptop there, playing YouTube videos on everything from furniture repair and restoration, painting, different product videos, staging, and business-related stuff. I was, still am, constantly learning. I taught myself how to edit videos gradually over the last 10 years or so, initially for my personal Facebook page and fun Instagram stuff. <laughs> Who knew that several years later, I would be starting a channel on here and was already ahead of the game. Other videos I'm watching now are about YouTube analytics uh, and SEO, algorithms and still watching a ton of furniture related ones. Keep learning. Any free courses you can take are rarely time wasted and you never know what the next few years will bring. L is for listing, listing your pieces. Look to see what other furniture flippers around you are doing. What styles are they doing? What are their prices like? Are their items moving or sitting on marketplace for months? Just because a competitor's white art deco dresser isn't selling doesn't mean yours won't. Maybe their staging is terrible quality or they take dark crooked photos. Maybe their listing ad is too bare bones or too full of useless fluff. There is an art to making a great listing. It needs three key components. Number one, an accurate description of the piece, just the facts. Filler words like beautiful and gorgeous, etc., can add some flair to your listing, but just keep in mind those things are subjective. I see ads all the time for beautiful pieces that are questionable. Unless you know for a fact that a vast majority of people are gonna think your creation is fabulous, <laughs> maybe just avoid words like that. Describe what the piece is constructed of, colors used. You don't always have to mention products used. You can, but most people won't know what many of those brands are anyway. Mention the maker of the piece if you know it, the era of the piece if you know it. Speaking of which, get to know different styles of furniture and how to identify them. Mid-century, Art Deco, French Provincial, for example. Also, not everything from the 50s and 60s is classified as MCM. MCM is a specific style of mid-century furniture. It's not a time period. Confusing, I know, but it's a thing and it's a frequently mislabeled thing. You need to have full measurements in your ad. Some people think leaving out key information like this will cause buyers to make contact to get that information. Nope. 
most will just move on. Same with price. Contact seller for price is a sure way to have three quarters of your potential buyers skip your ad, myself included. If I'm looking at project pieces on Marketplace and they don't have measurements, if I'm really interested in the piece and the price is right, I'll ask for them. But if the ad has measurements and no price, nine times out of 10, I'll just move on. If your prices are firm, save everyone time by stating that in the ad, preferably near the top. Many people will only read one sentence of an ad before contacting you. If you're lucky, some don't read them at all. <laughs> It's just annoying. I don't hold any items without e-transfer payment. And I state that right in the ad. Way too many time wasters, window shoppers, and no-shows. And I don't have time for that. <laughs> Placing this in my ads will turn some people off, but I'm okay with it because I don't have time to wait all day for someone who won't show up. Meanwhile, I've lost two or three other buyers. Not only this, but because I'm a registered small business, I treat it the same way a typical store would. That is, if you want to purchase something, you have to either buy it online first and then arrange pickup, or some places will hold something for you for a couple of hours, give you time to get there before placing it back into stock. Number two, you need to explain how and where to get the piece. Don't put your address in the listing, but definitely put your town or community. I see this all the time, and I hate wasting time messaging people, only to find out they're way too far away, when if they just put that in the ad, we both could have saved two minutes of our lives. <laughs> if you offer delivery stated in the ad, along with either a flat rate fee if you have one, or state that there is a fee, but that it varies depending on location. If it's pickup only, state that. For either pickup only or delivery, if you're working on your own, make sure to tell the buyer that they will need to bring a helper. You don't need to advertise that in the listing itself, but just make sure when a potential buyer is ready that you let them know. On occasion, I've had to bring a helper when delivering to elderly clients or those with limited mobility who can't grab the other end of a piece to get it in the house. You need to let them know also how you prefer payment. For me, I do cash or e-transfer, and occasionally I'll accept credit card on bigger ticket items. But I make sure to let potential buyers know that the only way to fully secure a sale is with e-transfer. The main reason for this is not everyone can pick up the same day that they make contact. If they can only come two days later, I don't want to be in limbo waiting on a cash deal that may never happen. Also, make sure that you state that all sales are final, unless for some reason you're willing to accept returns and refunds. These are used pieces of furniture that usually have some quirks or character, not brand new pieces off a showroom floor with warranties. People need to know that refinished does not mean brand new. <laughs> Number three, Good photos and staging. A couple of plants and good lighting can mean the difference between a sale or no sale and $100 and $400, no joke. Dark, blurry, crooked photos with stuff in the background is a recipe for disaster <laughs> and no money. <laughs> People often tell me my staging is fantastic, but I feel that it's lacking in so many ways, <laughs> especially when browsing gorgeous show homes and designer pages on Instagram. I have a long way to go, but I've also come a long way. I didn't buy into the white walls are best thing right away until I finally got a white wall after seeing several people all saying the same thing. And oh man, what a difference. My staging props were still a bit weird, but the white wall took my photos up a few notches didn't compete with the furniture, and just had a more professional look in general. I realize not everyone has access to seven or eight feet of bare white or at least neutral wall to stage pieces on, but if you can find a way to make it happen, you will see a major difference in your photos. And if your lighting and staging are also on point, you will also see a difference in what you can ask for a piece. It sounds strange to hear that what is around the furniture in the photo can actually get you a better price for the furniture, but it's true. My white wall was in my storefront which I no longer have. My new staging area is in my workroom and it was a rather rough garage wall. So I decided I would add repositionable wallpaper as my background. I wanted white brick, but at the time of building my new workroom, I couldn't get it in my area and it was too expensive online. So I went with a white and gray sort of ship lap, ship lap look. That's hard to say. <laughs> It's fine and still neutral, but now that I have a little extra revenue from my YouTube channel, I think I might move the shiplap to another wall and get that white brick style wallpaper that I initially wanted. I also need to grab a few new staging items. I need a cool painting that will work with many different colors and wood tones and some new props. 
So I'm adding and replacing as I can afford to do. The other part of this equation is the photography itself. You don't need a fancy new camera unless you know how to use it. You can still take lousy pictures with a $2,000 camera and you can still take amazing photos with your smartphone if you know what you're doing. Your job with your photos, the whole point of taking good photos is to help the buyer envision the piece in their own home. Takes in a dark workroom or propped up on buckets or dollies, don't do that. M is for multitasking. This one is only going to apply if you'll be working in a space large enough to accommodate a few pieces at a time. One of the best ways to make the most of your time is to actually work on more than one piece at a time. People often ask me how I work so quickly. It's not that I'm actually that fast, I'm just more efficient than I used to be. Work smarter, not harder. If I'm partway through one piece and about to start another, I'll apply stripper to the new piece while I'm waiting for that to activate, I'll do a paint coat or stain or make a few small repairs on another piece. I sometimes have three pieces on the go at one time. It's the best way to get the most out of your workday. It's a simple point here to make, but one that has upped my output considerably. If you're only doing this part-time though, or if you don't have the floor space for this, this obviously won't apply. Well, that's it for part one of this two-part video. I hope you've learned some great tips and tools to help with either your current business or the one you're just getting started at planning. Part two has 13 more sections. Thank you so much for watching. This has been fun to make. I'm excited to get both videos up and get kind of your full feedback on them. This is a video that I wish I had had starting out. I had to kind of look up these points individually when I was researching for my own business. So I think having them all here in one kind of cohesive video will be, well, two videos. <laughs> Anyway, I think it'll be helpful for you guys. So comment below, let me know which letter in this video was your favorite and what you learned the most from and any other comments you might have. And I will see you in a couple days with the second video. Cheers.